Wright was born in the Norfolk village of Erpingham in 1958, one of four children. He grew up in a military family, living on RAF bases around the world with his father, Conrad, a retired corporal. He's a normal child. I mean, no aggression. He's a typical boy, just wanting to play. But family life was far from happy, and Wright's mother left when he was just eight years old. Wright and his siblings stayed with their father, who went on to remarry. Whilst he was living with me, there was never a problem. Never, you know, never see one even. He was happy. He had, um, Little Barney's, I suppose, with uh, his stepmother at uh, times when he weren't uh, a bit mischievous, if you like. But it was nothing that you would sort of think about an hour later. Steve was not a particularly bright young man, but you know, cheery enough in his own way. Left school at 16 without any qualifications to speak of and got a job working as a chef on the ferries which sailed from Felixstowe to the continent. By the early 1980s, Wright had become a steward on the cruise ship, the QE2. And it was during this time he reportedly spent money on sex workers during trips to Thailand, which some experts believe may have altered his perception towards the opposite sex. I think he's got an expectation of women Women are there to perform a service for him, to, to play a particular role. They serve a function for him. And that's something that we continually see throughout the rest of his life. He would often return home from sea penniless. The world's media descended on Ipswich and the cameras were all pointed at the police. I think this case was one that attracted so much attention because it was unfolding in front of our eyes. This was the era of reality television when, when that started to become very popular. We were seeing it as it unfolded on 24-hour rolling news and you never knew what was going to happen from one day to the next. Detectives told prostitutes to stay off the streets, but their warnings were largely ignored. A local news crew interviewed one of the girls anonymously. Why, why well, have you decided to come out tonight? Because I need the money. I need the money, you know? Despite the dangers? Well, that has made me a bit wary about getting into cars, you know? But presumably you, you will do that tonight? Well, probably. The woman interviewed was Paula Clennell. Paula Clennell, she had children and um, she was always trying quite hard to change her life. You know, she was happy when saw her, you know, nice girl, but yeah, she, she tried quite hard, you know, to get out of it, you know, because it's a very hard thing to get out of the addiction if you still live generally in the same town. But yeah, she was trying, you know, to get away from it and change her life, bless her. Just six days after that news report aired, Paula Clennell was missing. In December 2006, the police in Ipswich were under mounting pressure to catch a prolific serial killer. The bodies of three dead prostitutes had been found in just 10 days. They had no clues or potential suspects, and the killing wasn't about to stop. Two more young women had gone missing. 24-year-old Paula Clennell, who'd been interviewed on the news just days before, and now police receive reports of a fifth missing woman, 29-year-old Annette Nichols, the best friend of fellow prostitute Jade Reynolds. Annette was a girl for me that oh, I was so humbled to know. You know, she always took time for me. She'd want to know if I was all right, if there's anything she could do. She'd do anything for anybody else. She was always well kept. She'd greet you with a smile and a happiness. You know, you felt all right when you was with Annette. I did. I could think, oh yeah, wicked. There she is, you know. I kind of, it was a relief because I know that I could talk to her. She'd understand my problems. So when she went missing, that's kind of like tearing out a piece of my heart. As the police searched for Paula and Annette, there was a macabre inevitability in the air amongst the mass of international journalists who'd gathered in Ipswich. There was almost certainly going to be another discovery. Where was it going to be? Who was it going to be? 
It was nail biting, and whilst it wasn't, it can't be described as fear. It was really palpable. You 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 sensed that from the people in the town. You sensed it from your colleagues, uh, but also from other colleagues from other media organisations and the police as well. On December the 12th, another body was found in Levington, just a mile away from Nacton, in the same woods where Annalee Alderton had been discovered days before. While somebody was out walking their dog, they stumbled upon the body of a fourth victim, just a few metres away from the main road in Levington. In the undergrowth, also this time not in water, again, the DNA was important in, you know, in this case. Um, but what seemed quite strange about this one is that it almost had an appearance of a rushed approach, that uh, this body was deposited by the side of the road. Albeit a few metres uh, off the main road, it, it had the appearance, or it seemed as if it was, had been done quickly. The police sent a helicopter up to survey the woodland for evidence. As it circled the area, they made a further gruesome discovery. Another body was lying in the woods only a hundred yards away. The naked bodies were those of the missing women, 24-year-old Paula Clonell and 29-year-old Annette Nichols. I don't think I'll ever get back what I had with Annette with another girl. You know, this is the most beautiful woman that I'd ever known that had become quite important to me that I could trust. You know, and now it's not there. I didn't go out after that. I was quite sensible, because, like, I couldn't, I emotionally couldn't go out and work on the streets after Annette was found. Five women had been murdered in Ipswich in just six weeks. The press had named the killer the Suffolk Strangler. Alderton and Clennell, they were both asphyxiated. That was the cause of their death in the other cases, the changes after death really prevented pathology giving a definitive answer, although I think it's reasonable to assume that someone who's killing five people in a short space of time probably used similar methods. Interestingly, none of the five victims showed any sign of sexual assault. So it isn't a rape murder. It's not, oh, I've satisfied myself, now I'm going to kill you, murder. It is a targeted murder without a sexual element. He is very much feeding off the media frenzy that, that's being created around his crimes. And he's increasingly feeling even more in control of, of what's going on. So he's changing the way that he's doing things and he's looking at the reaction from the media when he does that and he's absolutely loving it. He believes he's fulfilling something. Maybe he's convinced himself that He's clearing the world of prostitutes. They're all dumped very, really quite close to each other. Demonstrates that he thinks he's doing something in his own fantasy world that is cleansing the world of evil or cleansing the world of dirt or cleansing the world of inappropriate sexual appetite. We'll never know. I don't think Wright probably knows now. All I do know is that he had to be caught because he wouldn't stop until he was. On December the 15th, Tanya Nichols' dad, Jim Jewell, made an emotional plea for the killer to turn himself in. Tanya has been taken by someone who needs to be found. We ask for anyone who knows this person or persons to come forward and contact the police. With increasing pressure to make an arrest, police decided to question a local 37-year-old man. He was identified because he had spent considerable time in a radio car talking to a radio journalist and uh, other um, TV journalists. I spent a bit of time with him uh, to try and get to know his relationship with the girls. There was uh, a kind of a, an, an understanding be between them that you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. He was uh, loosely associated as a friend of one or more of the girls who were murdered. And at that stage, he became of significant interest to the inquiry. There was a very strong feeling from some of the media people present that this man was the right man and should be looked at more seriously. 
With a suspect in custody, detectives received a lead from the forensics lab. The three bodies that were found on dry land did have DNA evidence on them. In a one in a billion chance, the DNA found on all three women was the same. But whose was it? The DNA was run through the national database and police got a match. But to their surprise, it wasn't the man they had in custody. At that time, and as it still stands today, if a person is arrested or convicted of an indictable offence or serious offence, uh, they can have their DNA taken and held on the database. The DNA matched that of a local man who'd been convicted of stealing £80 from a pub till in 2002. 48-year-old Steve Wright. And it was that match which led to significant additional work including then the CCTV evidence, which showed a vehicle being used by Wright moving between some of the locations around the relevant times. So he became a major suspect in the inquiry. Over just six weeks, five prostitutes had been murdered in Ipswich. The police finally believed they'd found the killer, 48-year-old Steve Wright, whose DNA had been found on three of the bodies. Wright had not been a suspect at any point during the police investigation, even though he had been stopped during routine checks of the red light district. Whilst the world's media was focusing on a local man who police currently had in custody, Wright was put under surveillance. Stephen Greveson was born in Sunderland on the 14th of December 1970. He grew up in a large family and his parents were reportedly violent towards one another. You are molded by the environment you live in. It's, it's, a, it's a fact, everybody knows this. So if you grow up with violence, you tend to be more violent than people that don't. Greveson appears to show some psychopathic traits in childhood. Some of his old school reports are looked at by a psychologist at his trial. And within these reports, they talk of his lack of empathy, about his callousness, about his real lack of emotion towards other people. I think there are a few red flags in Stephen Greveson's childhood, but they're not necessarily red flags that say to me, this person's going to turn into a murderer. They're red flags that say, this is somebody who perhaps needs some help, needs some support, you know, later on in childhood and, and in their teenage years. Growing up, Greveson was often in trouble. And in 1982, he was arrested for shoplifting. He opened a, a packet of nails inside a, a shop. He didn't take the whole pack. He took one nail and he got caught. Um, and obviously the owner of the shop didn't like that very much. And he actually went to court for stealing one nail. <laughs> one nail, not a pack of nails, one nail. But he was only 11 years old. Extraordinarily, he was taken in front of the magistrate. Now, for most 11-year-old boys, that would be the most terrifying experience imaginable. And they would certainly not dream of doing it again, even though it was, in many ways, absolutely irrelevant, tiny crime, certainly not punishable by anything significant. But it's interesting that Greveson didn't take that experience as any kind of lesson. He simply brushed it off, water off a duck's back. He simply went on and did what he wanted to do. At the age of 13, social services made the decision to remove Greveson from the family home. Well, when he was an adolescent, he was taken into the residential care system and he ends up at a children's home in Carlisle. Greveson's troubles continued through his adolescence. In May of the same year, 1990, Sunderland was rocked by the murder of a 14-year-old boy called Simon Martin. He'd been found semi-naked and bludgeoned to death in a derelict building after running away from home just days before. I remember the Simon Martin murder very well. Um, we had five murders in less than a week in Sunderland. And in hindsight, looking back, whether that was putting extra pressure on the police with a given murder inquiry involving 40, 50, police officers, a hell of a lot of police resources, and whether that would have put strain um, on the, the Simon Martin murder at the time. 
The police initially thought they had quickly solved the crime after arresting a local teenager. He was 16, he lived nearby. Um, he was a respectable lad from a good family from memory. And he'd been playing in that building uh, with others and they found his fingerprints in the building. And there was blood in the building as well and they found his fingerprint in blood, which was just coincidence. All charges against the 16-year-old boy were eventually dropped. The murder of Simon Martin would remain unsolved for 23 years. But during the original investigation in May 1990, police had also spoken to a local 19-year-old man named Stephen Greveson. He's somebody who had a reputation in the local area for hanging around with, with people younger than him. And I think when you've got somebody who's trying to, to get a sense of control, get a sense of power, you often feel that they hang around with people who they see as slightly inferior to them. Greveson was questioned by the police in the wake of Simon Martin's body being discovered. And Greveson said, yes, I certainly I saw him, but he was fine when I left him. Greveson was released without charge. Three years later, the discovery of the body of 18-year-old Thomas Kelly would trigger a series of similar deaths that would spread fear across the whole of Sunderland. By the winter of 1993, 22-year-old Stephen Greveson had built up a reputation as a troublemaker. In November of the same year, Thomas Kelly, an 18-year-old student, had gone missing from the family home he shared with his parents and his sister, Lindsay. My brother Thomas was just a normal boy for the time, just kind, helpful. He would do anything for anybody. Love life. We wouldn't go to bed on a night time without saying we loved each other. He used to call me Pins instead of Linds. <laughs> <laughs> which was a bit strange, but uh, that was the way we went on. We argued quite a bit, as brother and sister do, but never went to bed without making up. We were very close as brother and sister. We were close as a family. We didn't have loads of money or nothing like that, but we, we went out and done things together, silly things like willy picking and, you know, we just... Very close family, I'd say. Lindsay vividly remembers the day her older brother disappeared. I went to school, me mum went to work, and then Thomas had left for college. And that was the last time we'd seen, seen him. It was actually a bit strange that morning because we were very close as brother and sister. But that morning, you were standing by the fireplace in my mum's house, and um, as we said bye, he walked forward and grabbed my hand and squeezed my hand. On November the 26th, 1993, the emergency services were called to a burning shed on an allotment near Monk Wearmouth Hospital in Sunderland. The fire attracts attention inevitably, and the body of Thomas Kelly is found. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like for whoever arrived on that allotment to confront the sight of a, a burning body in a burning building. It is gruesome. When I came on the news, I wasn't listening to the news, and I'd, I was sitting in the house, and I'd seen my dad cover his face. And I went, what's wrong? And he went, there's a body being found. And they say parents get a feeling. I don't know where they go feeling at that point. Thomas's badly burned body had seemingly destroyed any possible evidence, and senior detectives at Northumbria Police were not convinced that he had been murdered. Detective Wilson was certain that all three deaths were linked. Not only were the crime scenes extremely similar, all three boys had attended the same school, Monk Wearmouth Comprehensive. In August 1994, Wilson asked for a second post-mortem to be carried out on all the bodies by a senior pathologist. 
You don't just call a friend and say, oh, can you re-examine the body? No, you have to get you know, court orders and judges and everybody involved. And this detective was relentless. He went after it and he got the court order that was needed. This is a detective that he knew that something was wrong. You know, when you read a case and, and you just, you, maybe it's a gut feeling or there's something there, you go, okay, this cannot be like this. On closer inspection, all three teenagers appeared to have died in the same way. So in Graveson's case, the most important factor was that the ligature marks are then identified. We're now moving from three similar but apparently discreet incidents, albeit involving three young boys from the same school, to three potential homicides from the same school the same way. Now you're almost looking towards a serial killer. I think that the fact that Stephen Greveson killed his victims via strangulation is very significant because it's one of the most personal forms of killing. You are watching the life drain out of them. He's probably feeling more in control at the time he's killing his victims than he's ever felt at any point in his life before. So I think it's a very deliberate choice of method. I think they were groomed, encouraged, cajoled, or perhaps even threatened by Greveson and they paid the price with their lives. I remember the day very well, I was on The Sun, when um, Northumbria Police uh, revealed that they were treating the deaths as murder. Um, and tragic as it was, the family would have seen that as a victory, um, that finally something was happening. Detectives had found fingerprints and a footprint belonging to Greveson in the derelict house where David Hansen was murdered. They were from a burglary Greveson had committed months before, but proved he had access to the property. And by September 1994, Wilson had retrieved some conclusive evidence. Seaman found in the stomach of the third victim, 15-year-old David Grief, was a DNA match for Stephen Greveson. If you burn the outside of the body, then you can lose injuries. If you lose the skin and the soft tissues beneath it, there's going to be less and less that you can see. But it can be surprising what you can still identify, particularly if the area is protected from the fire. You can still see maybe stab wounds. You can see all sorts of things that many people who try to dispose of a body by fire think will be gone. Greveson was already in prison for robbery after holding up a fish and chip shop. Stephen Greveson was a bully. He wasn't nice. He used to go around picking on lads and taking stuff off them. He picked on teenage boys, old women, anybody that was smaller than him, I think. He was a troublemaker someone to keep away from. When Greveson was arrested for the murder, we weren't shocked at all, because it was what we were fighting for, for months. We knew it was him. We knew that those boys had done nothing wrong. We knew that someone had done that to them. In June 1976, 25-year-old Jack Unterweger was found guilty by a court in Salzburg, Austria, of the brutal murder of a young German woman. Unterweger confessed. He was sentenced to life. However, Unterweger served just over 15 years. He was released in May 1990, and only a few months later, prostitutes started to disappear. For the next 10 months, Unterweger went on a killing spree across Austria, the former Czechoslovakia, and even the United States. Unterweger was suspected of murdering 11 women, but was convicted of just nine. I'm absolutely astounded at the fact that Unterweger was released from prison many, many years before he should have been. People like Unterweger can change. They can change in prison if they acknowledge that what they've done is wrong and if they undertake work to address those traits and those behaviours that lead them to the decision to harm others. But he didn't go through that process at all. He was 
without question, perverted, depraved killing machine. And I can think of very few, probably less than 20, who would deserve comparison with him. It is an extraordinary story, and one which sends a shiver down my spine every time I tell it. In 1975, during the trial of his first murder, Unterweger was assessed by a psychiatrist. He was diagnosed as an extremely dangerous, unpredictable and incurable individual. The report stated he demonstrated egocentricity, aggressiveness and sexual perversion with a sadistic component. Psychopaths are people who feel and behave and relate to others in ways that are different from the rest of us. The way that I often describe psychopathy is it's a form of emotional emptiness. So there aren't that complex range of emotions that the rest of us have, like love and guilt and regret. It is quite black and white for psychopaths. I want this particular thing and I'm going to not stop until I've got it. Dr. Reinhard Haller is a leading psychiatrist in Austria who worked on the case. Studying the first murder, it was clear to him that Unterwege was an exceptionally callous killer. This was a highly sadistic murder in which he abducted this girl who was walking home on an extremely cold winter's night. He drove her naked through the forest with a steel rod in his hand taking great delight in her impending death from exposure, but ultimately strangled her with her bra. It was an incredibly vicious, an incredibly sadistic moment. Unterweger became famous as the man who wrote children's stories, poetry and prose about life in prison. His autobiography, Figa Feuille, meaning purgatory, became a bestseller and was made into a film. The Austrian literati were delighted to have discovered someone like Jack Unterweger. Unterweger suddenly attracted the attention of the media. People showed support for his release. These were people, some of whom were very well known, like journalists and artists, who showed their support for good reasons. Let's say they had good intention. The intellectuals said, wonderful, finally we have a criminal who reformed himself, who, as it were, confessed to his actions through his writing and processed them therapeutically. Such a person can only be a good person. And they fell for him, they really fell for him. Austria at the time was in the midst of reforming its prison services. Jack Unterweger's newly found literary prowess in prison was just what the reformers needed to prove the new system could be successful. The calls for Unterweger's early release grew louder and louder. Intellectuals, artists, writers, journalists and even politicians campaigned for Unterweger to be free. Now there was unbelievable pressure for his release at all costs. And that's what finally happened. However, there were voices who warned that hiding behind this charming and manipulative man is a very dangerous, malicious narcissist. On the 23rd of May 1990, 39-year-old Jack Unterweger was released from Stein Prison in Lower Austria. He had only served a little over 15 years of his life sentence for strangling an 18-year-old to death. He was actually released without any safeguards. That means he did not even have to go to see his probation officer or to a psychiatrist where he would have been treated further. He was completely free. A brutal killer who is now going to embark on what I think is one of the most horrifying killing sprees in modern European history. Unterweger was given a second chance as a free man, thanks to the campaigning of Austria's artistic community to release him. Unterweger moved to Vienna, where he mingled with the rich and famous. He played the role of the model rehabilitated prisoner. Unterweger had them all fooled. 
obviously the people who ran the prison wanted to advocate in their favor because it's a great advertisement. They see the system works. We can put somebody who is as bad and as evil as a psychopath who kills somebody in cold blood. And this psychopath has rehabilitated in 15 years. He is now a writer, a person who is known by the people in Austria. So he was the success story of the criminal justice system. And I think we got too carried away with that and lost sight of the fact that this was an individual who had harmed someone else, who had taken someone else's life, and that wasn't something that had been addressed, so of course he was going to do it again. Unterweger was released from prison without the need to regularly speak to a psychiatrist. There was no real supervision, and he was able to live the life of a free man. He was very charming, quite intelligent, but also a highly manipulative person who was not mentally ill, but had an abnormal personality. He moves to Vienna, becomes the darling of cafe society, buys a white Ford Mustang. This is a man with some considerable uh, vanity and turns himself into a uh, famous guest part-time journalist, uh, writer, television studios, radio talks, reads his poetry to adoring crowds, many of them women, and generally struts his stuff. Unterweger became a celebrity and often appeared on television news programs. In June 1991, Unterweger traveled to the US. He stayed in the former Cecil Hotel in downtown LA. It had a reputation for violence and suicide at the time. Unterwege was not the first serial killer to have stayed there. It was already famous as the hangout of the night stalker, Richard Ramirez. Within a few weeks of landing, he had killed three women in Los Angeles, all of them prostitutes. And I think there was a sense in which he was getting a bit bored. And often you see this with psychopaths. They have that, that proneness to boredom, that need for stimulation. So they will often start to vary their offending behavior to mix things up a bit and to keep it interesting. So I think potentially that was what lay behind the decision to, to continue killing people outside of that country. All three murders were meticulously planned in advance. Unterweger's first LA victim was Shannon Exley, a prostitute allegedly popular with truckers. Nine days later, he killed again Irene Rodriguez, originally from Texas. And five days after that, he killed Sherry Ann Long, who was later found in the hills of Malibu. All three women were strangled with a bra using the same very distinct knot, a signature. Some people use a certain method, for example, with strangulation, that would be the MO, the motus operandi. But if they use the strangulation with a cord, then the cord would be the signature. In his case, I don't think he used the bra of the girls a lot of the time, but he did a specific knot. I don't think he did the knot because um, Untervega wanted people to know it was him. He did the knot because he knew the knot worked. And it's the same thing that it happens with so many serial killers. They use a method or a signature because they know it works. Untervega left LA and returned home to Vienna before detectives could link him to the murders. But while he was away, the police in Vienna were now working closely with their counterparts in Graz, the site of the murders after he was released from prison. They realized the murders were in fact linked. A pattern started emerging with Unterweger being in the same area of Austria that the murders were committed. The police realized they were now dealing with a serial killer. On the 13th of February, 1992, one year and nine months after he was released from prison, an arrest warrant was issued by the Graz judiciary. Unterweger had fled with his girlfriend, this time to Miami, but his escape didn't last long. He's finally tracked down to Florida in the United States because the authorities have begun to put various parts of the puzzle together and He's arrested and extradited in May 1992 to stand trial in Austria. 
When he talks to the television camera and he says, I've only had two years of freedom and he appears to be quite upset, we shouldn't be fooled by that. The only person that he feels sorry for is himself. And this is a skilled manipulator. This is somebody who's learned by observing the behavior of other people, what kind of emotions he can display that will elicit some kind of sympathy. During the extradition process, Detective Ernst Geiger from the Vienna Police Department discovered further links to prove Untervega's guilt. He'd searched Untervega's home and found evidence of his visit to L.A. So he contacted the L.A. Police Department and discovered the three similar murders in their district. The evidence found at Untervega's home placed him in the areas of each crime scene. The detective expanded his search across Europe, asking if there were any other unresolved murders with the same M.O. Prague police replied with the case of Blanka Bodskova. She was the first woman Untervega killed after his release from jail. The case was building, and Untervega was charged with the murders of 11 women. On the 28th of May 1992, Untervega was extradited from the US to Austria. The minor celebrity and poster boy of prison reform was again in police custody.